Okay, great. So now we've finished the detailed description, the claims, and uh, everything seems to be coming together. So what we're looking at next is the final pieces of the puzzle. That's the summary, the abstract, and the title. <laughs> So the summary can be, if you want a shortcut to the summary, instead of writing you know, a summary from scratch to describe the kind of highlights of the, of the invention, uh, you can take the claims and turn them into plain language and use them more or less as a, as a, a layout for your summary. So the claims can be uh, converted to plain English and used as the summary and that'll save you some time and otherwise you, know, you can write some of your own features. Sometimes the summary is, is reviewed by, uh, say, potential investors uh, into your idea, so they may uh, want to understand a little bit about the invention from the summary, so you may want to have an introductory paragraph or two describing you know, what problem you're solving and, uh, and so on. But for the meat of the matter in the summary, you may uh, just draw on the, the material and the claims. So that's one shortcut for the summary. The abstract is basically 150 words, uh, uh, summary, so much shorter, so usually we use one of the independent claims for guidance on what the abstract should read. So in this case you could take claim one, turn it into plain language uh, for, you know, for the purpose of the summary and then take that same uh, description of claim one and put it into the abstract. Just make sure it's 150 words or less and that'll complete the abstract. And then finally the title. So the title can be what the article was called in the preamble of the claims. So if you called it, you know, coffee press, or you had a, um, a liquid infusion uh, device, that'll be the title. You want to keep it general. You don't want to say, you know, um, espresso press, because then if it's useful for tea down the road, then the title might limit the application of the invention to coffee, in which case you'd miss out on the tea market. So that's, uh, that's it basically to finish up the invention um, description. So that'll complete the materials of your patent application. And then the patent application gets ready for filing. So there's a couple of concepts that you should understand at this stage. The first is who the inventors are. So the inventors are is anybody who has an inventive contribution. So something that is described in the claims. So if your friend suggested, you know, a modification, you tried it out, it didn't work, they don't have to be listed as an inventor. But we recommend anyone who has inventive contribution be listed as an inventor in the, in the application. In fact, you're required to do so. Um, so if in doubt, you could have someone listed and then you can have their rights assigned back to you or to your company, etc. if you want to retain sole ownership over the invention. Now the second concept to understand is ownership. So ownership is the assignee. So an assignment is made from the inventor, who's the first owner of the invention, to usually a company he works for, or a corporation, or you know, if it's if the invention is later sold, then it'll be assigned to the the purchaser of the invention. So that's what those concepts are. Here we are at the USPTO website. We're getting ready to file, so it's uspto.gov. Click on patents right here. We file online. You can see it's the second link here. It's EFS Web. <clears throat> EFS Web. Fillable forms. Here's the information disclosure statement. This is the application data sheet. This is the form that you'll file with the uh, patent application. Okay, so now we have the uh, application data sheet in front of us. The title of the invention here is going to be on the patent disclosure. Then we're going to put in the legal name of the first inventor here. So prefix, doctor, Mr., Mrs., first name, given name, family name, suffix, city, residence, U.S. residency, non-U.S. residence, and um, then the city, state, and country of residence. Mailing address is put in down here. 
correspondent information could be a um, an attorney, for example, so that um, email, etc., is sent to an attorney. But in this case, if you want to file it yourself, you can just put your own email into uh, the correspondence information and add um, other emails here as necessary. The title of the invention is marked down here. Application type. Here you get to choose whether it's a provisional or non-provisional. Subject matter, it's going to tell you utility, plant, or design. We're going to file utility. Design is for the aesthetic features of a product, and plant is for the uh, plant breeding information for a uh, plant breed. So we're filing utility here. The total number of drawing sheets, if any, so you may have two to three drawings. Suggested figure for publication, you can recommend uh, a figure that you want to appear on the front of the patent. So in this case, you know, it may be a perspective view. That's uh, what's typically selected for that. So filing by reference, if you have an earlier related application, you can file it. You can put the information in here. So this might be where you filed a provisional and then the one year mark you're filing a non-provisional and you want the application to relate to that provisional you can put the information in here down here you can request not to publish or early publication um, I would recommend just leaving it as uh, as usual unclicked representative information domestic benefit national stage information so this again is a priority document so where you claim the benefit of a, uh, a PCT application and this is a national entry into the US. We have a foreign priority so you could file in Europe for instance you'd have the same one year period in which to file in the US so you might put the European application information here. So then this is the applicant information. Remember I, I was distinguishing between an inventor who has a part of the invention process and the applicant is the one who will be overseeing the application. So usually in this case, it would be the assignee who would then receive the, uh, the rights to the invention who will then prosecute it. So if you're just filing this for yourself, then you'll also be the applicant. So put your name in under the applicant here. You can click whether it's assignee, maybe legal representative or a joint inventor. Um, person to whom the inventor is obligated to assign, that's if you're working for a company and in the contract you are required to assign it and, um, and so on. So if you're just filing it for yourself, then you won't uh, click any of those. You put the information in here and then it has also the, down here you have a room for uh, another, um, sorry, is this the address? Now that's the address for the applicant there. This is an assignee, so you can put down the assignee. It may be the same as the applicant. Or maybe nobody. You may just leave that blank. If, you, if you're just filing for yourself, then you would fill out just the inf inventor and applicant. And then here's your signature well, along with your, uh, the date of uh, the signature and then printed first and last name. And then you will send that, send that off with the filing. Okay, this is your provisional application cover sheet. So a little more straightforward. Here's the inventor listed here. You can add additional inventors and it'll change the form. Here's the title of the invention. And then down here is the correspondence address. So you'd have firm or individual name here. And then you put the individual's name and address. And then the application here. Is it uh, made by the US government? The answer is no. And then on the next page, you have your signature here. With the uh, status, um, micro or small, you want to make sure that if you claim micro entity that you actually qualify because it can lead to invalidity of the <laughs>